The following is a fourth hand production. Welcome to Sad Times. Uh, just to let you know, uh, our show uh, is uh, something that I host, Kate Crisp, uh, every week where I bring on a guest, usually a very close friend of mine, and I talk to them about being sad. I talk to them about how they act when they're sad. I talk to them about how it affects their life, maybe how they react to other people being sad, because I think that we all go through our days and we all kind of deal with this uh, on a macro or micro level. And we kind of all pass each other and we're not really paying a lot of attention to it. And, and it kind of throws everybody off. So I thought it'd be a really good idea to have a pretty open conversation about that. So we do that every night. So, um, or every Thursday night. Uh, so please feel free to chat in and, uh, I don't know what you're seeing, but I think you're going to see a split screen and you'll see my dear, dear friend, Michael Cole, uh, who's come on. Hey, Michael, how are you, man? Hey, I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing well. Tell us where you're yeah. uh, broadcasting from. I am uh, broadcasting from Fort Wayne, Indiana. Whoa. They have internet there? Home of Shelley Long. Shelley Long's from Fort Wayne, Indiana? Yes, sir. Wow. Okay. You know, I was sad when uh, Sam and Diane didn't end up together, but that's all right. Spoiler alert. Well, that's, yeah. um, that's on brand for your show. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So uh, I guess I'll start by saying uh, how I met you. I've uh, known you since I was 18. I met you my freshman year of college. We were in a show together, and uh, the first like table reading rehearsal, you were there, <laughs> and you came in and you uh, were selling hemp necklaces, and you're really fucking pushing the hemp necklace on me. Calm down, bro. You're really pushing it on me. Why did you want to sell me a hemp necklace so bad, Michael? Because well, cigarettes were only like two bucks then, and I just have to sell like two bracelets and pack of cigarettes. That's so. a fair point. And yeah. Michael is one of the uh, people who got me to start smoking cigarettes. So thank you, Michael. You're welcome. Uh, appreciate that. Um, <laughs> so we obviously met, we became fast friends. We kind of learned pretty quickly that we had a lot in common, not just in wanting to do theater, going to the same school, loving the Beatles, things like that. Uh, we also found that we were both kind of anxious guys. Uh, I think that's fair to say. And Absolutely. Pretty quickly into our, our friendship, we started to talk about that. So uh, something I brought up on the show a couple times and I'll probably bring up more and more often is about how I would feel sad as a kid and kind of feel isolated and alone and didn't know who to talk to about it. So I wanted to ask you, can, can you kind of tell us your experience? Tell us about where you were in your family uh, uh, and like how you fit in and if the sadness kind of brought you out of that or anything like that. I mean, what do you mean where I – where you was fit in, in my uh, sorry, what I mean is um, how many siblings did you have? Okay. All that stuff. Yeah. Um, my parents were both married before. My father had two girls and a boy. My mother had two girls. They both got divorced. They got married. They had me. Mm. So I'm the youngest, the only one from the two of them. And I have five older siblings who are all technically half siblings. Okay. And did any of the older siblings live at home when you were growing up? Yes. Uh, two sisters, Missy Ann and Michelle. I've. Two sisters named Missy, so that's why it's Missy Ann. Ah, gotcha. And did you um, kind of hang out with them a lot, or did they kind of shun you, or what What was that like? No. When I was really young, you know, I was like their, their baby doll. They carried me around all the time. But, of course, you know, the closest one was like five years older than me, so as soon as they were like middle school, high school, there was definitely some separation there. Did you – how did you deal with that? Um – you know, <laughs> a lot of uh, solo hobbies, a lot of playing outside by myself because yeah. I lived out in the country. I couldn't just pop over to a friend's house. So it was like, you know, to orchestrate actually having a friend to play with. So. Oh, yeah. Did you have like an invisible friend? I didn't, but I thought that I was on an invisible TV show. Oh, were you the star? Oh, yeah. 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 It wasn't very entertaining, but it was always there. It was always you know, there. A, okay. a virtual camera following me around all the time. So did you talk much when you were a kid? No, I was really shy. Yeah. You're, you're yeah. still a quiet guy now. Yes. I, I get that a lot. People tell me that. Yeah. Do you think that uh, – do you just choose your words well or have you always just been somebody who's maybe just a little reticent to speak? 
Now, I tend to sit back and before I really like engage and have long conversations with people or just feel free, you know, to do just a little small, like small talk, I, I really want to know people. So I sit back and listen to people for weeks, months before I feel comfortable enough to engage. Yeah. You were just that guy in all the hemp who didn't say much <laughs> except for pushing hemp necklaces at me. Yeah, you're well, like fucking. You know, you got to turn on that Oscars. salesman thing. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Um, so, so girl, wait, wait. you've just never let this go, have you? Well, no, of <laughs> course not. We get hemp necklaces. I had. No, I hear about it. I was wearing that hemp yeah, necklace. Overreaction. Hey, hey, I'm unbuttoning a button. Okay. This <laughs> <laughs> shirt's gonna come off. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> no, I just think it's funny because I can still picture we were up above the theater along that table. You were at the end. Yeah, was... I was sitting here. I just, it's such a fond memory of mine. Um, oh, I remember it too. It, it was that weird little room kind of off of the, uh, yeah, right. off at the back of the theater. Yeah. I've never had a uh, reading in there before or since. Yep. Yep. So, um, tell me about when you were, <clears throat> excuse me, would you deal with sadness as a kid? I, you dealt with anxiety, right? Yeah. Uh, both or just one or the other? Yeah, I, I had some little pockets of sadness, I recall. And I can, like my earliest one, I just remember laying on the couch, just staring up at the ceiling and just, blah, and looking back, I'm like, wow, that was just profound sadness. It was the first time I felt just all-encompassing profound, profound sadness just laying there. Yeah. How long did that last? I mean, that was just a short episode, but it was it was very memorable. So yeah. I, I guess that was the first time I'd really just felt all over sad and couldn't explain it. It wasn't because of something per se, but it was just there. And then I've had stuff like that too. And I just kind of would retreat into my room. It sounds like you were already in your room. Uh, maybe. Uh, do you know how old you were? I don't. I would say maybe seven or eight. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so your parents are still married, right? That's true. I just think of that because um, your parents uh Agreed. I uh, I was eight when my parents got at that. So I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit. I want to talk to you about when you lived in that basement apartment. In oh yeah, college. I know you yeah. spent a lot of crazy. I did, and that was yeah. Yeah, go, go ahead. Oh, just saying that uh, that was a time in my life where I I just was trying something where I would say yes to everything. Someone's like, you want to be in my student film? Yes. You want to be in my short play? You want to audition for this play and this play? So I was way overloaded and constantly doing things and not sleeping a lot during that period. Okay. That kind of get into your... It did. I had a couple of weird episodes where I would come home in the afternoon and try to nap. And one time my alarm went off and before I fully woke up, I went over to my stereo and ripped all the cables out of the back because I didn't know what the sound was. I woke up while I was doing this. So you were like standing was, there doing that? Oh yeah. I pulled like uh, a dozen RCA cables out the back wow. already. And the fucking alarm was still going off. Yeah, and I that didn't be frustrating. Yeah, that and one time I woke up and thought I saw someone sitting on my desk. So I was exhausted to the point of hallucination. Really started to hallucinate. That yeah. wasn't not in a drug way that was no, it wasn't. I was smoking a little pot at that time, tiny bit of mushrooms, that's it, but okay. not in those instances. So would you say that uh, your time in school, even though you and I would kind of talk about how we get anxious and things, it was actually a pretty good time for you? Yeah, absolutely. But I'm going to ask you this. What what would you say? You're, uh, you're 40, right? I am. Yeah. What would you say is the hardest hardest time of your life? Oh, the hardest time of my life. That's, yeah, it may have been, it was kind of, kind of bookended periods there around the same time, like the last three months before I left Carbondale. Yeah. And then the last three months that I was in Florida, those were both very, very hard times. Why is that? Well, the Carbondale one, I'd stuck around there way too long, and I was just becoming a community member, and I got a job in a place where there was a lot of drugs, and I was profoundly addicted to cocaine before I left. Wow. How long were yeah. you addicted? I did a hard six months there at the end. And could you tell anybody about it? 
No, I didn't. Like the only people that knew were the people that I was using with. And I, that didn't really last long. I ended up using just alone, like wow. in my basement. In your basement? Three in the morning. Were yeah. you living with somebody? Yes, I was with, you know, yeah. my ex fiance. Was. Oh. No, didn't have a clue. I was very good at uh, hiding that. And you, so you moved to Florida with her? Yes. You guys were engaged to be married. That's true. And then you said, kind of, tell us what happened. Well, one day I just came home from work and <laughs> she started crying and said she did not want to get married. And furthermore, she did not want to be with me anymore. And that, like, you know, people say there's signs that came completely out of the blue for me. Thanks. And that kind of rocked my world. And we had three months left on our lease and we decided to live together for the rest of that time. It was an odd time. So obviously, I only. Yeah. Tell well, us how that manifested. Did you stop eating? Uh, type of thing. I did. I like one thing that I kind of tied it to was. One of the reasons that she gave is just like living down there in South Florida and her aunt was extremely wealthy and our friends were wealthy and she just felt like we didn't have enough and we weren't going to. So I like stopped buying food and I would just eat samples at work when I worked at Whole Foods. And then I just started exercising, you know, all the time as well, just kind of trying to tell myself this is going to make me better. And I got down to 139 pounds. Wow. You could, yeah. So you could see the veins through my, it was bad. And you, would you stop buying food because you were trying to have more money so that you guys had more money so she felt happier? It wasn't going to change her at that point. I was just so ashamed of being poor that I was trying not to spend money. And did you try to win her back? I did. I wrote her some decent poems. Yeah? Didn't work. No? She liked them. Didn't oh. Work. We did... Uh, we did end up continuing to have sex, though. So that was really? a bit of salve on the, uh, yeah. Did that, on the hurt was there. that weird? A bit. Yeah. At times. And a couple of times it was, it was super great, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Also, and did she, and there was just no, there was no her going like, oh, I don't know. It was just like, no, after there was that no day, waffling. Yeah. She made her, she made up her mind. And yeah, we just kind of got drunk at the beach one day and decided, you know, if we're still going to be living together, we might as well just keep having sex. Okay. All right. I do remember uh, talking to you then. Uh, it was a fucking... Yeah. Uh, the way That's that right. you sounded on the phone was... I kind of like... You sounded like your voice was only 139 pounds. Like, you sounded lost, distant, yeah. gone. You didn't know what I to didn't do. know. Yeah. Because you had moved down there for her. You worked on a boat, right? Yeah. Uh, but you had moved on to Whole Foods by this point. So did you yes. have friends down there? You said you met. I did. Them. Yeah, I started having some friends. This kid, this Cuban kid that I worked with, we were really good friends. Okay. Uh, did you did you retreat into any sort of substance to deal with it then? I did actually. Uh, I had for my birthday, I'd I'd gotten a little cocaine to treat myself a couple months before we broke up, and then once that was gone. Um, yeah, I started hanging out with this guy. So, gotcha. you know, see, here's, here's the thing that addiction will do to you. I wasn't buying food because I was ashamed of being poor. And then I was buying cocaine. And that is way more expensive than food. Yes, sir. Can, can you tell me what it's like if you've done a lot of cocaine and that wears off? And is that just a profound sadness? It is. It is intense. Yeah. Um, yeah, when I was back in Carbondale, how I dealt with that was I just smoked oh, very, very high grade marijuana twenty four hours a day. You had right. some I man. All right, calm down, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would wake up and hit the bong. I would hit the bong like eight strong times to try to get to sleep after partying all night. Wow. Yeah. Uh, do you <laughs> a, a funny aside, do you remember when we uh went to go see the second Harry Potter movie? <laughs> yes. And, yes, I do. Uh, I was at I was at the couch, and you had that amazing surround sound, and we uh, part, partook, and uh, uh, I was so out of it. And the surround sound, there was a speaker behind the couch, <laughs> and I was sitting there, and I was like, "What is that?" And I remember very slowly coming and going up 
over the couch to look, and I remember either you or or your uh, fiance said something like, "Kevin, are you okay?" And I was like, <laughs> "And I was like, oh, it's a speaker." We go to the movie. <laughs> I have a a, a, a coat oh, yeah. top that's like a free movie ticket, but I didn't realize you had to go and redeem it and stuff. So I've got a book in one in one pocket. I've got this Coke thing in the other, and I have a Coke that I'm like sneaking in, and I'm like I don't want to get caught. And so I bring it, and I just slowly put it under the little window, and I'm like one for Harry Potter. And they're like, No, you need a ticket. You need to redeem this. And I was like, I don't know. Oh, and I like slowly yeah. reached in and pulled it back, and I, everything was in slow motion. And then so, I yeah, we don't take about, pieces of plastic for right. movie tickets. You know, you wouldn't thought they would i fell asleep about 10 minutes into that uh yeah we both slept thing. most of that yes yeah. yes um see okay. the fond memories of drugs as well that's well it's like uh, bill hicks right uh i had a great time on drugs yeah that's bill hicks um so okay so you uh break up you and your fia- uh, fiance at the time ex-fiance and uh you moved uh i think you were going to move home and then you came right to yeah. ohio yeah, the way I saw it was I was going to go home and work in the brass mill. Like that was my life. I was going to have to go go back home and do what all of the other people from my high school did. You know, D- uh, did the sadness? Did that make you angry? Um, what my yeah. how sad you were? Did that like ever manifest into anger? Especially if you were around the person who hurt you. Not, not for a while. It did like once I got home. Okay. Yeah, because I did. You know, go back there for a few weeks and drank way too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Try to forget that. And then we, um, uh, Michael and I worked at a summer theater together that summer. That was my saving grace there. I have to say, I reached out to you and you told me there was a, maybe some more parts left. I reached out to Bill. Bill got me in touch with him and I was able to go to that. That saved my life. It was, um, it was a great summer. Yeah. We we uh we lived in a room uh that seriously had <laughs> a twin mattress, a a very small little walkway, and another twin mattress, and that was ninety percent of the room. And then there was a TV at the end of it, and our dressers were in a closet, so we yep. had to share this. Michael was somebody who needed the TV to go to sleep. I was not. <laughs> Luckily, we were drunk as hell every night that we tried to go to sleep. We didn't have to be at work until six. Well. Turns out that one night I had been drinking a lot and I was that night I had been drinking a ton of wine and I was wow. dating a girl and I didn't know how to date. I didn't know what I was doing. I was jealous and ate up about it and so sad and all the time. And I drank this bottle of red wine and I came back and I wanted to go into the bedroom and Michael was in the bedroom and the door was locked and I was knocking on the door and Michael was in there with somebody. And I figured that out, and then I started being the asshole that I was because I was so upset, and I, I felt like everybody was wronging me, and and, and I, I don't remember what I said. Maybe you can tell us what I said. Uh, I think I brought something up, or... I don't think at that point there was, you were, it was more like you were confused. I, I was in there, we were not clothed, yeah. and uh, you're just banging repeatedly, banging, banging, banging on the door, and just yelling to let you in. I'm like, oh, yeah, I need a moment, but uh, you you didn't just, like verbally lash out. Okay. It was more just confusion and really wanting into that room where I was uh, the young lady. Yes, and you finally you finally came out, and we had words. I picked and a fight you, with you. Yeah, you kind of kept coming at me, and then yeah. yeah. And then uh, you shoved me into the door and the glass broke. Yeah. And it was uh, – and then the girl I was dating drove over to get me and then I uh, went back to where she lived and I collapsed on the blacktop and I was just so despondent, just weeping. It was so fucking dramatic. <laughs> Perfect for fucking summer theater, man. Yeah, you got to have some drama on and off. That's right. That's right. Uh, so we uh, – and then the next day I came home and uh, we, you were sitting on the couch and I was, I walked in, we just looked at each other and we both at almost at the same time said, I'm sorry. And then we, you know, we hugged yeah. and stuff. So, yeah. and I remember that summer um, you would talk to me about your relationship. And, and at that point it seemed more like definitely more in the angry, angry phase. Yeah. Is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And we both uh, started dating girls there. Did you still feel five, six months removed that you were still pretty torn up about what happened oh, yeah. with your ex-fiance? Yeah. I was not ready for a relationship at all. 
so how do you think that manifested in the way that you acted in your relationship? Yeah, I was not super kind to her um, after after we left, you know, and she wanted to continue this long distance relationship and I was in no shape to do that. Our phone conversations in retrospect, like, you know, looking back, um, I was being rude uh, to try to push her away in our phone okay. conversations. You were just trying to get out. Of it was not fair. She was a super nice girl. And, yeah. uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, gotcha. Okay. Uh, so you guys broke up. Then uh, you met another woman when you were on tour. Yes. And she was playing my son. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> she uh, she played that. Tiny Tim, and I was Bob Cratchit. Oh yes, right. Of course, yeah. that's right. Because the girl I dated that summer, we came to see you guys after we'd been out late that night, and uh, oh, God. so hungover, so hungover. Uh, you'll start to get a at theme the Masonic Temple in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. What's that? I said, you'll start to get a theme here with the sunglasses. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you went on the road with her. Then you moved to New York with her. Yeah. Tell me about how that was for you, for yeah. you. Yeah. Well, yeah, we did two tours together. And yeah. then and I was very much into her. I was very much all about it very, very quickly. Uh -huh. And it was working out. Was this different than the girl from the summer? In, in that, like you were actually like you were able to be into her, you were able to let go of maybe some of that other stuff. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Got it. Yeah, this was I'm like, yeah, I'm ready, and this is just perfect timing, and this girl's great. So. And then you moved to New York. You guys had that. Well, she had a roommate, but he was never there or something. That's right. He'd uh, he was opening uh, a new branch in Barcelona. He worked Where? for uh, Barcelona. One more time. He was an Do it in the. Oh, yeah. Barcelona. 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 Yeah. yeah. Okay. He was from New Zealand, and I accidentally Zealand, mocked him. Huh? Yeah. I accidentally mocked him to his face once. Yeah. Could you tell that story, please, real fast? Uh, so we, we talked about him all the time when he wasn't there. Uh, this this young lady and I, and I would always do his voice. You know, I talk like I'm from New Zealand, and <laughs> um, and then it just would come off any time I would say Barcelona, and then he was back one time and. You know, we were standing there in a circle in his living room talking about it. And it's like, he's like, oh, yeah, I love Barcelona. And I just went, Barcelona? I'm sorry. <laughs> just silence. Did he look at you? Yeah. He's like, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Barcelona. Tapas. Uh, got lots of tapas. I remember either the first or second time I spent some time with you in New York, we were at a bar in Midtown. Uh, once again, Rudy's. Again, Brood, was it Rudy's? Were you guys Rudy's with the free hot dogs. Oh no, sorry, that oh. was uh, the corner thing. I don't remember. Yeah, and Barry Bonds broke the home run record. I looked up and I was like, "Holy shit, he just broke the record!" And I looked down, and Michael was being kicked out of the bar. Yeah, I ended up going a different way. I met up with an old friend of mine, an old ex girlfriend. I ended up in Brooklyn. I was like, "I don't know where the fuck I am." Uh, she wouldn't let me <laughs> come back to her place. I was like, "Oh, okay." So I had to get back <laughs> on the train, and then I. Luckily, knew kind of where your place was because it was so close to the train stop. Hmm. And then I came in, I passed out, and then do you remember the flood came in? Oh my the, gosh! The subways flooded from all the rain or something. But I'd you, forgotten you were there for that. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you were gone for a lot of the night or something, and you and the girl were fighting. Is that right? Yeah, there was. Oh, we were in Midtown, and then she had me come all the way down to the Lower East Side to bring her the key because she forgot hers. Oh, yeah. And then so I had to come all the way back up yes. to Midtown to try to meet you, and then, she, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, as you guys lived together, how how did the relationship progress? Was she somebody who also kind of was anxious, who got sad, or did she? No, nah, she was. It was ninety five percent bubbly, positive, fantastic. And then she had a very dark 5%. What What do you mean? Like she would, yeah, it wasn't, uh, you know, up and down, bipolar. It was almost all the time just perfectly, you know, funny, uh, getting along, smiley. And then sometimes just you could see the face drop and I, you did not want to be in the same room with her. Damn. She would just tear into you for anything. And would that usually because she was upset about something with herself or, and that's how it yeah, manifested? Yeah, she would, uh, yeah, that's a lot of it was, okay. she would, 
yeah, straight to lash anger. out for things that was going were going on with her. What's that, Brock? Straight to anger? You she, said she went straight to anger. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, and the anger, like, was just like triggering on everything. It was it's it was so hard to take in because she was on like almost all the time we're like best friends we're yeah. cracking jokes we're, and then just to not recognize her yeah. suddenly it was very off just a yeah okay. complete wow so then you guys decided you were going to move to Chicago is that right no we were going to move to Nashville we we lost uh, the he gave up his apartment that was rent controlled and so uh we were going to be out we yeah. didn't know where so yeah. we were going to move to Nashville. We told everyone that. Then we backed out of that. We found an apartment on the Upper West Side. Uh, a deal. A one-bedroom for 1600 This what? was 2007. So. In New York? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That was a deal. Yeah. Like five blocks from Columbus Circle. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. And then last moment, she decided, like, I didn't have to have anyone sign for me. I with the job I had and everything, but she had to have her parents sign at the last moment. She decided she didn't want to put that on them. So she, so I had no apartment. She wanted to just Craigslist, Craigslist like sofa hop for an in, indeterminate amount of time. And I could not do that. Okay. So you came, to I Chicago couldn't deal with the impermanence like that. Yeah. So I came to Chicago. And then what happened with you two? I thought we were together. I thought we were long distance. I thought she was going to devote, you know, devote herself hundred percent to you know, acting and singing for a while, give it one last go. And if things didn't work out, she was going to come to Chicago. Her parents live in Chicago. She's very tied to Chicago. Okay. And then I see on her MySpace, this is aging me, yeah. that, uh, yeah, she's got some nice flowers from some guy from someone she called like her love. Um, it was what? not for me. So I found out on MySpace that we were not together. What was your reaction to that? I called her. I'm like, what's going on? And she's like, did you really think we were staying together? I'm like, I'm still telling people about my girlfriend. And yeah, I had no idea once again. So did that kind of bring you into another kind of depression? Yeah. Yeah. That kind of, yeah, that, that hit me hard there. And yeah. Uh, yeah um, and then she wanted to stay on my insurance. Oh. Yeah. I had a, that gave me a little piece of, I enjoyed telling her that no, that's not gonna. Happen. So gotcha. I got that little bit of a parting shot, and then yeah, I was basically celibate for the next year and a half. Do you, when you were that broken or that down about stuff, do what? What do you do generally? Do you retreat? Do you kind of stay at home other than when you have to leave for work and stuff? What? Yeah, yeah. But, but uh, luckily, I had like a built-in friend system. I had, uh, you know, Alan and Lori lived upstairs in my building. You were there then. Yeah. Nick had yeah. come there then. So I had reasons to leave. But I mean, I didn't operate yeah. as a single man might do at that point. I just had zero confidence in myself uh, in the idea of- that anyone would want me at that point. When you say zero confidence, like self-loathing too? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's like, I must be just, yeah, worth absolutely nothing. How do you, how did, what, when you would have those thoughts, what would you do to try to get those out of your head? (laughs) That's probably something I should have done, but I just kind of reveled in them at the time. You reveled in them, okay. But no, I did uh, positive stuff. I played a lot of music at that point in time. I, you know, very isolating things whenever I would. I started doing a lot of recording at home, you know, and laying down multiple tracks. And that's what I would do from the moment I got home from work to I go to sleep, get up, work and do the same thing. And then I'd see you guys sometimes. I do remember you recording a lot of music then. Yeah. I was like, um, I was still at that time, my first year in Chicago, you moved right after I did. Uh, I was still really hung up on the girl from the summer we were in Ohio. I was so depressed about it. Yeah. I, but I wouldn't talk to her, and uh, I thought about her all the time. And I remember writing a poem <laughs> about her sitting at your computer Nothing. in that Sheridan Road apartment mm-hmm. um, long, long ago. Um, so then you met your wife. Oh. Yes, I did. And um, your second date was a show that I was in or something like that? Yeah. 
Okay. Well, actually, no, that's not that's not true. That was the second time I saw her. Okay. Uh, I first met her in uh, Liz's basement apartment, and I knew that she was just out of relationship. So I'm like, I dig this girl, but I'm not gonna pursue that right now because that would go nowhere. Mm-hmm. So I was like, wow, very nice to meet you. And then like three months later, I go to see your show and Liz is there with, yeah, with yeah. Allison. Right on. And, yeah. Okay. And I ended up sitting next to Allison at that show and I found her horrible allergies to be just charming as charming hell. Charming as hell. <laughs> yeah, so I had to get her number. Okay. That's where, yeah, that's where we started dating. Uh, and then uh, Brock, is there any, any, just want to check in any chats or anything? Yeah, we're good. Okay, cool. So, um, you date Allison for a while, uh, then you guys get married uh, yes. in Chicago, still living in yes. Chicago. Mm-hmm. And then um, how long after you guys got married did you have the issue with your back? Well, I'd had intermittent issues with my back, but uh, it was the last one that really took me down was uh, about a year and a half after we were married. And what happened? I had injured my back. Uh, at work years before, and then it would just kind of crop up once or twice a year, uh-huh. take me out for a while. And this time, and they would send me to the same clinic every time. And they'd always say, rest for the, take the rest of the day off, do five things of PT over the next couple of weeks, go back to work, limited work tomorrow. They would say the same thing every time. And my back just kept going out. And then this time the woman's like, no, we need to do something different. This is not right. I'm going to send you to these people. They're going to suggest a course of treatment. And yeah, Whole Foods wanted a second opinion and I wanted to not have my back go out twice a year. So, Okay. And how long were you out of work because of your back? Six months. And all the while, Whole Foods was uh, refusing to pay me. So how did you do it? Well, how did you feel during that time? It was awful. I mean, I knew I couldn't work. I knew my back was never going to get better if I didn't seek different treatment. I did get different treatment at that time, luckily. At the medical treatment. Yeah. I mean. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what did you do to while away the days? I find myself when I always think, "Oh God, I just would love a day to do nothing." I don't do yeah. well with doing nothing. It, it lets my head starts to go. I start to get very anxious. Um, I start to get really down on myself. I start to really self-loathe. I start to say like, well, you're fucking worthless, whatever. So having to, to, to not be able to work day after day, how Mm -hmm. did you deal with that? Um, positive ways. I would, I would take shuffling walks around the neighborhood because my back would start to loosen up and feel okay. If I was able to walk for some distance, Mm -hmm. I would try to do that, get out and keep moving. I watched a lot of uh, a lot of TV. I watched the baseball, Ken Burns baseball, a couple times. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then I uh, I started doing drugs. Started okay. What do you mean? I mean that's when I found my major cocaine hookup in Chicago. Oh, so you were doing cocaine when you were out of work? Yeah. Now going back to what we talked about before, were you? having to smoke a lot to go to sleep? Um, I, no, I wasn't. Uh, no, no, I wasn't. I would, I would just stop and then I would be like, I, I was also, I did have, I was on prescribed uh, benzos and painkillers at that point. Did those help you sleep? Yes. D- did you, when you're in the midst of that, did you know that you were in the midst of something or did it just feel like I'm getting through the day? With the cocaine? With the cocaine and the, yeah. Um, yeah, I, yeah, my brain didn't really let me realize this was a thing for a while. You know, it kind of throws up uh, those blocks so you don't realize how deep you are in and then till it's real deep. And then you say, oh, okay, I'm just, I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm just not going to do it today. I take the day off and then suddenly it's 11 PM and yeah, you're having something delivered and going all over again. Did you, did uh, anybody else know about this? Um, no, just, uh, a guy that I met who was part of the delivery service. Gotcha. Okay. And how long did that last? That, that, that round? 
six months six because it was after that as well after i'd gone back to work okay so then you moved to fort wayne yes, sir and uh you've been there god five years now i came here uh, september 2014 so okay. almost five so years. just almost five years and you guys bought that house about four years ago I bought it May 2015. May 2015. Okay. Uh, it's a nice house. I like that house. Thank you. Um, how how's it been in Fort Wayne? Have you uh, – how, how do you like it there? I surprisingly love it here. I was not sure that I would. Yeah. yeah. Were you – when you first got there, did you miss Chicago a lot? Oh, my God, yeah. How did you deal with that? <sighs> yeah, I mean – Came back to visit a, a few times, yeah. but kind of tried to immerse myself in Fort Wayne. It's like this, I knew this is where I'm going to be now. Did you feel the absolute... um, depressed? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it was also a relief to get away from uh, a re ready supply of cocaine, though. Okay. Yes, indeed. I'm sure it was. Uh, mm. So, uh, and then I know you worked from home at first. Yep. Did... Uh, when I worked at home, the same thing would happen to me. I would get really down on myself. It gave me too much time to think, not around other people. I'm definitely an introvert, but I do sometimes need to be around people. But most of the time, I don't. But sometimes, if I don't have it for long periods of time, it's not It's not great. Mm -hmm. I was kind of lucky in that sense. We were living with my uh, in-laws okay. for like six months. And uh, so I could go upstairs and chat with Paul or... You know, whatever. So I always yeah, had people in the house there. But yeah, that job wasn't super for my brain. It was, uh, I was doing remote tier two wireless networking support. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. yeah. People don't know what you're saying. So yeah, it's hard to describe that to really old people. Have you, since you've uh, been in Fort Wayne, run into, you've uh, run into some drugs again? Yes. Okay. Do you want to talk about that, or would you rather not? No, I can. Okay. Well, tell us. Tell us what what that means. Like, where where did that lead you? Um. I. Yeah. I found out that you know, I'd always been curious about the dark web, of course, uh -huh. and I'd heard of Silk Road, and I'm like, oh, that's just gone. So, but I looked into it, and guess what? It's not gone. There are lots of replacements. Okay. So I. Ended up getting into that and just the novelty of it. Yeah, I got a couple things here and there. What do you mean fine. getting into that? You mean like getting stuff sent to you? Yes, and that which is not great because I was using you know the U.S. Postal Service to receive contraband. Um, this is cocaine. It's some of it, yeah. Yeah, okay. And were you telling anybody about it? No, absolutely no one knew about this. Okay, and you had I a received... oh, go ahead. Hmm? I received uh, a cocaine, uh, molly, acid. Yeah. yeah. The first things I got. Yeah. Uh, would you oh, do molly? some really good weed, too. Would you do molly, like, around the house or, like? Or, or... I would do just micro doses of things. You okay. know, that was kind of into that. Yeah. With, uh, with most of the harder stuff, I would do a micro dose and you just... Have a sunnier day. That was it. Would you find once that went away, would you find the same sadness as when you were doing a lot of it? Or was it kind of more balanced? No. No, it was more balanced that way. Did you feel isolated and alone when you were doing that? Oh, yeah. Did and you? I had, I literally did isolate myself. Yeah. What, is, and what, what, like how? Well, um, I wasn't sleeping in. Like our bedroom at that point, I was sleeping in my office, and so it was easy to just, you know, be in here and do that, or go down in the basement and do that. And nobody had any idea. No, no. And did this get worse? You had a the procedure on your throat. You had your tonsils yeah. out, right? Yeah, I had uh, my tonsils out. It didn't go great. I ended up uh, in the to, ER. To say the least. Yeah. Yeah. I ended up in the ER, like projectile vomiting blood. Yeah, that and was then you awful. Got, and then did I you get inhale your I, own blood. Yeah, I aspirated, and I got aspiration pneumonia, and I got pleurisy, which 
if you don't know what pleurisy is, it's an aggravation of the sac that surrounds your lungs. So basically, you can't breathe without extreme pain. And they had me on uh, OxyContin already. And so they just kept giving me that, increased the dose. And I was using it as prescribed when they told me to do it. And then you know, the pain held on a little longer because I'd had to have recauterization in my throat. Yeah. And then, of course, the pleurisy. And then the doctor stopped prescribing it for me just, and I got sick. Like sick, do you mean like uh, dope sick? I got dope sick, yeah. What is that? What is that? What is that? It's awful. Can't, you get like sweats, like and I've had sweats. People have had the flu. They've had sweats. This was not that. Like, I woke up one time and took my sweatpants off, and they made an audible noise when I dropped them on the floor because they were so soaked in sweat. And I was so sick, I found some painkillers. And then I was able to find some painkillers uh, through the dark web. So I would start to get those in. And then those got to be so expensive that I figure... Why not just go to the root? You know, I get some heroin and I'll take just the tiniest bit. I'll make my own pain pills. That didn't really work. It was unpredictable. So then I ended up snorting some heroin and then that kind of snowballed. Okay. And um, would, would, did it become a point where if you didn't use it, you would get sick? Yes. Yes, it did. And how long? Were you and on? I would get. Oh, go ahead. Well, I would, you know, get more of it. You know, the way it works, you tell yourself, oh, this is going to be it. You're going to slow down, get a little bit more to try to wean off. And then you end up going through it and you panic and you have to get more. So I was getting like a few shipments a week. Yeah. To your house? Yes. Well, actually, no. I ended up getting a P.O. box. Okay. And when you were not sick, when you were high, did you feel like you didn't have any problems? or is It did help that, yeah. yeah. I would... I would smoke before going to bed. I would smoke to go to bed, then wake up in the middle of the night, smoke a little more. Um, yeah. And then what? On and what, off throughout the night. How how did that stop, or how were you? Oh yeah, I'd once again I bought a larger amount, meaning to step down, and I'd also gotten some pills of oxycontin because I was going to chop them up and then wean myself off and i ended up uh smoking about seven to nine points of heroin in one day uh, and is that a lot sorry if that's a stupid question that's almost a gram okay which yeah, was a lot, a lot. okay yeah and and then i had you know just a little less than half a gram and those pills i'd smoked some of the pills too and uh there is so many questions on the dark web everybody wants to know uh, can, you, can you explain the dark web and silk road and yeah i won't how give you, you any from getting ripped off well i mean i don't i do not suggest this to anyone you know you take precautions and hiding your IP and all that, hiding your location, and you have to get a special browser. It's, it was the Onion browser, and you find uh, links that are good links, and then you have to write stuff down because you'll get fake links that'll send you to other places. So you have to make sure you get a good one and then write down as many as you can. I memorized them, and they were super long and <laughs> alphanumeric weird shit. You'd I used to rattle them, them off. Mind. You can just <laughs> rattle them off. Okay. I used to, but I, I don't. I made myself forget them. But the, it works on an escrow basis. You transfer Bitcoins into your account, and it's held in escrow until you actually receive it and release the funds. So you don't get ripped off. And there's, it's a review process, too, so people know who's selling good stuff. And Oh, like, a, like Amazon? Like you, people leave reviews? Okay. Absolutely. It's like... So there'd be like if somebody ripped people off, so you would just get lower reviews. Yeah, no one would buy it. No one. Yeah. yeah. Um, is that anything else, Brock? No, that, that, yeah. that was quite a bit of it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so. Uh, oh. Uh, oh, go ahead. You're asking how that ended. Yeah, I was. Do you have say, another I, question? I, or? I was yeah. going to bring up something. I was at a mutual friend's wedding, um, John Dooley's wedding. Yeah. And uh, I, um, 
I got a, a text from your dad. Uh, and he asked me to give you a call. And uh, so I hopped out. And I feel like I don't believe you answered that. Probably not. But you tell me about that time. Do you remember what I'm talking about? It was like September 22nd ish. Yeah, that was. Yeah, I it was me trying to, to come off. You know, I was already off actually at that point and I was in deep withdrawals and I was so depressed. I, it, it's, I can't even explain it. It's how depressed I was. So I'll tell you kind of what led into that yeah. is my regular order did not arrive. Okay. It got lost in the mail and I couldn't get anything else in. And I did my other stuff cause I thought this was coming the next day. And, uh, then I started into withdrawals bad. I was sweating through everything. I couldn't sleep. If you've ever had restless legs, I had that intensely for 24 hours a day. Couldn't keep my legs still. I couldn't sleep no matter what I did. It was awful. And I would go to the post office to expect to get my stuff. And there in like the third day that it wasn't there, I remember driving home and considering veering off and hitting a tree so I could go to the hospital. <laughs> and stop feeling like that. Wow. And then it got so bad that I was kind of convinced that if I went to the right doctor, they would uh, understand and they would help me kill myself. I was having kind of hallucinations. Wait, sorry. Do you mean like Kevorkian, like assisted suicide, or they would yeah. you give you pills? No, no, no. Like, yeah. That they would assist me because I. Yeah, I was so depressed. I could not, I could hardly move and I couldn't sleep. And I was yeah, starting, you don't sleep and you start to go a little psycho. And uh, yeah, I really thought that my depression was such that they would agree with me that I, I shouldn't be living anymore. Really? That's how, where I was. So you, wow. But you never did go to a doctor about that, right? I'd been you? going to the doctors frequently and lying to them about what was going on with me because I was having severe anxiety and depression due to the uh, vacillation from yeah, yeah. heroin. And just to, I just want to kind of tie it back real fast. You were prescribed by a doctor, OxyContin. Yes. And you took it as prescribed. Yep. And then he said, okay, you're good on that. And then yeah, no, no weaning off, nothing like that. Okay. And, and I got very sick. Okay. Um, how long between that time when you got very sick from the weaning, non wean off to when you, the, uh, the shipment didn't arrive. Uh, let's see. The non weaning off was probably in February. And, uh, yeah, I, September 16th was the last time I did heroin. So it was a while. It was protracted. Because I I managed to make myself not... I'd come down off of the opioids. I did manage to do that. But then I was kind of uh, just getting recreational with it. Okay. Um, and that's why it extended that long. And then I got to it again. Uh, so you, I just want to touch on the depression one more time. Uh, I got a lot to say. Yeah. So tell me, tell me about that depression. Tell me about, were you able to talk to anybody about it? No. Well, about the depression. Yeah. But not of course what was really going on. I was seeing a therapist frequently. I was going to my doctor all the time. They were trying to figure out what was going on with my brain and why I would just be, you know, racked with sobs and bawling my eyes out multiple times a day. But they, and and they had no idea you were doing any of these drugs. No. Okay. And okay. Yeah, it it got really bad where I mean I would just look at my son and just lose it. The I was super ashamed is... and Brock's got a question. Did the sadness drive the drug use or did the drug use drive the sadness? It's it's a combination. I you know, after Further on in the story, you know, talk about like, getting clean and all, but uh, I had been suppressing a lot of trauma for a long time. 
and hiding that with drugs. I, yeah. A lot of bad things that I did not deal with at the time just kept stuffing down. And, yeah. and um, so ultimately that trauma, that deep sadness is what led to the drugs. Yeah. I was trying to cover, cover it up, trying to push it further down okay. and not think about it. So after we or I got that text from your dad the next day, uh, is when you and I talked. Well, we texted. What happened that day? I think that was, yeah, the... It was a Sunday. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, I was still dope sick. I was yeah. still in deep withdrawals. And the day before, I I was with my son, and I started crying. And... I put him in his high chair with some lunch and then I sat around the corner watching him, but I didn't want him to see me bawling like that. And I had to call my in-laws to come over and watch my son so I could, yeah, huddle on the floor and racking with, yeah, racking sobs and bawling my eyes out. And yeah, and it didn't get any better the next day. I took a bath trying to relieve my restless legs, see if I could get some rest. Nothing was working. And then I just, I text my therapist and admitted to her what was going on. And she suggested I go to the hospital. My wife had already suggested perhaps going to the hospital just for the depression. Mm -hmm. And then I, yeah, I said, I was going to do that. I was going to tell my wife. I went down and told her everything that had been going on. I text Kevin, told him I was going to the loony bin. And uh, yeah, then went through that process, that process being going to the, went to the behavioral health hospital. They said, go to the emergency room. I went to the emergency room. I said, I'm a heroin addict. Uh, They check me through there. They make me sit in this uncomfortable chair for three hours. Multiple people come in and interview me. They give me drug tests. I beg for something to help with the symptoms. They finally give me something that was not really, you know, helping. But then I was checked in to a secured ward uh, behavioral health facility. And how long were you there? Eight days. Eight days. And then um, I remember, uh, where, where'd you go after that? So wait, sorry. When yeah. you're there for eight days, that's to get off the withdrawal and the, the manage, to manage you off of the drugs, right? It, it was to manage the withdrawal try to get me some sleep and to make sure that I wasn't going to kill myself. And the place was completely suicide proof. Like everything, you couldn't put anything over the door in the bedroom in our room or else an alarm would go off. There weren't any handles anywhere. It was all thin. everything was rounded surfaces. So you couldn't hang yourself. up. Did you have suicidal thoughts when you were there? Somewhat, but yeah. not real aspirations. Yeah. Just, you know, <laughs> I'm down this far. Yeah. I don't think my life's going to be okay again. And then you, what happened when you left the hospital? My wife told me I was not welcome at home because I'd lied to her so much for so long. And it was such a huge betrayal. She was trying to process this and see if there was any way we could pick it up and move forward. So I had to find a halfway house. I was not allowed to leave the hospital. I was secured in there and they would not let me they don't let you leave without a and my wife would not sign off on me coming here so i had to find a halfway house i finally found one that would take me and yeah so i went from a behavioral health center to a halfway house so when you're in the halfway house you had said earlier were you able to see your son i was yes she did bring him in to visit me twice. And- okay. And he was, uh, was he excited to see you? Oh, yeah. Did you still feel that shame then? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. What? Uh, yes. is, that, is that what you were feeling when you were watching him eat, as you described oh, yeah. earlier, when you were crying? Like, how, could I, how could I do this? I have you know, this perfect, wonderful child in my life. How can I... You know, be trying to numb myself when I have something this good. Yeah. How long were you in the halfway house? Uh, 
I was there for like a month. Okay. Then you came home, right? Yeah. In. No, oh, go ahead. Who, me? Oh, I thought you were going to say, thought you were gonna say <laughs> something. Sorry. Yeah, I they I didn't even have a room. Uh, they actually put me in an old closet with a sink in it. And when I got there, it was freezing. There was no heat in there. And then after a few days, they got the heat on, but it couldn't be controlled. And it was like 85 degrees easy in there. And were you really depressed there? Yeah, that's not, it's a dark place. Man, almost everyone was halfway home from prison, not from the hospital. So, Did you find that they were also in a dark place? Yeah, or they were really nice. Obvious? They were really, um, really nice lots people. of really nice people. Yeah. I mean, most of them weren't on a path where they actually wanted to be rehabilitated, but you know, they were doing what they had to do at the moment. They were really nice guys though. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I did have one incident, but yeah, you had an incident with somebody there. Yeah. Like yeah. a fight. No, no, he was just trying to, well, it was some threatening, but he was trying to get me to drive him to a liquor store. And I get kicked out if I do something like that. Yeah. Like, I can't risk that. Yeah. And he was pressuring me and pressuring me. And I just got out of there. And suddenly I'm back in my closet, you know, back through two dark rooms by myself. And this guy comes to my door and he's like pressuring me. And that was a little intimidating. The implication was, yeah. How long rough. did that last? You mean that like him pressuring you and like keeping on you? Uh, it was just like on and off for that whole evening. He apologized the next day and then, yeah, it was weird. So now that you're back home, uh, you're clean. Uh, how are you dealing with the, that deep sadness that you say kind of led you to the drugs in the first place? Is that something you're, you're able to deal with on a more healthy basis? Yeah, a lot of unpacking, a lot of realizing, a lot of therapy. I I go to uh, NA meetings. I have a sponsor. I'm trying to be more open with everyone. I like no one really knew the extent of this for over a decade. Like this was something that I hid deeply. Like this is therapeutic for me, just being able to say all this stuff because no one knew this was going on. Yeah, I mean, as candid and open as you're being is amazing. And, uh, it feels good to get it out at this point. Yeah. That's why I, I went to like 60, 60 NA meetings in 60 days. Uh -huh. And just knowing that everyone had similar stories. And everyone had heard all the crazy shit that I thought you know was out of this world. Like they'd heard all that before and more. So. And how did that feel to, to be around people that had similar stories to feel that empathy with them. At that point I had to do it. And I, my, like out of the hospital, I was still physiologically not in a good place. Like I had extreme anxiety and I was on some heavy deterrent drugs. Mm -hmm. Like if you give half of my medication to someone else, they'll be on the floor for a day. But it you was passed out. Yeah. It was barely, you know, calming me down at the time. My anxiety was so profound. It felt like my whole body was buzzing and like I was going to pop out of my head. And that is what made me feel okay at the end of the day is going to those meetings and talking with all these people. And I would put my hand up, you know, in every meeting and it shook like this the first day. And then every day it was a little less. And you know, they're like, we've been there. We know what the, we know what that's about. And do you talk to your sponsor a lot? Not as much as I should. I'm, you know, still feeling this out. It's so yeah. all brand new for me being clean. I hadn't been clean for like, once I got my 30 day chip, I, I said, I figured out I hadn't been clean for that long since I was 18 and had mono. Wow. Um, can so. you, can you show the tattoo that you got on your arm? Sorry, Brock, we're messing up your, your shot. Uh, explain that tattoo, please, and why you got it. Yeah, that's, I got that actually. It worked out with the appointment and everything. It was on 30-day clean okay. day. 
It's it's from a series of books, first of which Kevin bought me that summer in Ohio, the uh, Dark Tower series, Gunslinger. And this means, this is Ka, which means destiny or purpose. And it really just kind of spoke to me at that at yeah. that time. Um, awesome. Uh, so we're going to have to wrap up. Unfortunately, we're, we're kind of at time for this, but, um, how are you, tell us how you're feeling today. Just in general, it sounds like you felt really good talking about this stuff. Yeah. Um, you sure, I, I have, you, you look great I and, think and you, I gained 35 pounds. Yeah. You, when I last saw you, you were, um, you looked different. So you look great. Oh, thank you. And thank you very much for talking about that stuff with us because I can't imagine that was easy. Yeah, I had some story. some very good, uh, some very fortunate things happen to me around that time too, uh, miraculously. So you got I'm, a good job, I'm right? Gonna, yes, I yeah. got a job that I absolutely love that I didn't think I could even hope for. Yep. You know. A lot of people are very appreciative for you sharing. Absolutely. Yes, Michael, it it means a great deal. And um, I, I know that the the whole one of the main reasons I wanted to do this is to bring people on to be honest about what they've been through. And you've been so terribly and tragically honest. And it's been uh, amazing. I learned a lot stuff I didn't know, even though I talk to you almost every day. And um, I think I admire you. And I te- as I tell you all the time, I'm pretty fucking proud of you. Thank you. You're doing shit that I can't do. And, um, thanks for, thanks for coming on. And, uh, I love you. Love you. And, thank uh, you for the support. Yeah, always. And, um, thanks everybody for watching this week. Yes, thank you. Um, you know, Mike, Mike is a viewer of the show too. So, um, I'll he, be in the chat. He'll be in the chat. What, what will be your chat name? It's M Cole 1978 because I'm unoriginal and old. Okay. Sounds about right. Um, Okay. Thank you again, Michael. No problem. And uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for watching. We'll be back next week uh, around 8 p.m. And uh, who's it going to be? Oh, I'm going to fuck. Calm down. Uh, 8 p.m. next week, 8 p.m. Central, will be my sister, Kelly, uh, who uh, we're going to get into some deep, dark shit. Um, <laughs> so please, uh, I don't say that for the entertainment. Yeah, we're just going to go until gonna, they pass out. And I think it's going to be really helpful for people in a different way because Kelly and I are pretty candid about growing up and we're, and she's had some really hard times, um, of late as well. So, um, I hope you can join us and, and hopefully we can bring some peace, uh, uh to you. And, uh, once again, thank you again, Michael. Of course. And that's a badass microphone. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. Thank you, everybody. Michael, have a good night, my friend. You too. Have a good night, everybody. You've been listening to a fourth hand joint.